The following is a Barrett Sports Media production. Every sports media star has a story. From the highs... We are number one. We just grabbed every key demographic. <laughs> to the lows. You're fired! The path to success is always different. To help you learn more about the industry's top broadcasters, Barrett Sports Media brings you the Sports Talkers Podcast. Now, here's your host, Stephen Strom. Episode 29, Sports Talkers Podcast. Great to have you in. Good morning, good afternoon, night, whenever you may be listening. Steven Strom here, very special guest for you today. Paul Feinbaum of ESPN, the New York Times bestselling author and ESPN commentator. Seen daily on the SEC Network and heard on ESPN Radio and Sirius XM Channel 81. Really interesting conversation we had uh, of his childhood, growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, how he became the face of SEC football and basketball really down in the south and just making a name for himself nationally we also talk about some of the instances where he goes toe-to-toe with someone like Nick Saban that is not easy to do by the way to stand up to a guy like Nick Saban and go back and forth and there's multiple YouTube clips of Paul and Nick going back at it so we kind of get a feel for where he gets that inner confidence from and then we have an interesting conversation about Jim Beheim and his relationship with the student media at Syracuse. A couple instances this year where Jim and the student media has gotten into it, and Paul has a really passionate take on what Syracuse should do with Jim Beheim. You don't want to miss that. Without further ado, we'll get to Paul, but rate, subscribe, and review, BarrettSportsMedia.com. we got all the great podcasts and articles ready to be consumed. So uh, without further ado, here is the fascinating Paul Feinbaum. So let's first start here, broadcast advice, I guess. Let's first start, give us a sense of your childhood and when you wanted to get into sports journalism first and uh, and just kind of take us through that route. I I think I I caught the bug uh, in my teens. I mean, I would, uh, sounds crazy, but I would talk to myself sometimes just like like a broadcaster would. Uh, I wasn't sure what what I wanted though. um, And I never uh, was really clear. I just knew I had a hankering for it. Then I got a little bit caught up in the law when I went off to college. And then uh, about halfway through school, I saw an ad in the school newspaper for a reporter. I went down there and I I was bitten. I didn't have a clue, didn't have any background. I learned my way. And for many, many years, I was a newspaper, uh, first as a reporter and then uh, as a sports columnist. And if I could tell you a little secret, I started to see the newspaper business in big trouble. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't made many good calls in my career, but uh, that one worked out and I got into radio, which ultimately led to uh, what I'm doing now. Absolutely. Just let talk about the reporting aspect of things with someone that did you have any experience and who did you lean on, I guess, when you first started doing this? I didn't have any experience, uh, but but I was a, a political buff, uh, and in my childhood, not it's not my childhood, but my teenage years, Watergate was happening, and I just had this hankering for uncovering the truth and, and changing the world. I was idealistic, to say the least, um, but I, I just think it was a, a curiosity, uh, and it was also a, a combined with a, a resistance to the to the establishment. Mm. Uh, uh, I wasn't I wasn't I was after the hippie movement, but I, I still when, when it was after the, you know, a lot of things were going on in the country. And I just uh, I tended not to believe everything I was hurt. I was told. So as a reporter, I I, I, I had some instinctive uh, knowledge. I didn't have the experience. Uh, and I also refused to take uh, anything uh, as the truth. So I kept digging and digging and and uh, was never happy until I, I was uh, I had exhausted every outlet. So you're at Tennessee at this point. Uh, what sport are you covering? Is it football? Uh, interestingly, uh, football was was always the main sport, but my favorite sport was basketball. And I happened to land at Tennessee just as two New Yorkers uh, were 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 making news uh, in the Tennessee uh, lineup. Uh, a guy named Ernie Grunfeld. You may have heard of him. He's knocked around the NBA a little bit as, a, as an executive, and and Bernard King. And uh, who was a legendary New York yep. uh, school ball player, as his brother was Albert. And I got I, I started covering them. Uh, I got to know both very well. And I I grew up a college basketball fan. Um, and it just so happened that Tennessee at the time was quite good. So uh, I would have loved covering college basketball the rest of my life. But I made this bizarre turn toward uh, Alabama <laughs> a few years later. Um, 
I, when you told your folks that you were going from law to sports journalism, uh, were they one of the were they the parents to say go chase your dream, or they were like, hey, there's a lot of money in law, and you know you don't start out making a ton of money in in, in sports media. Well, it's interesting. Uh, my mo- my mother thought I was crazy. I lost my dad, uh, Stephen, at 15. Um, although he would have told me to do whatever I wanted, he was mm. he was the good guy. Uh, in the group. I I once uh, joked that uh, after he died, uh, my mother became uh, both mother and father, and she was the kind of a a Vince Lombardi type where (laughs) (laughs) uh, I I pulled a name out of the 60s for for you young folks out there, but he was probably uh, the most hard-nosed pro football coach of all time at the Green Bay Packers. Um, So she didn't uh, discourage me, but she wanted uh, her son like a lot of – she was from Brooklyn, she wanted her son, like a lot of Brooklyn uh, Jewish mothers of that era, even though we were living in Tennessee, to be a, either a doctor or a lawyer. Mm. Uh, so I, I I couldn't do either one. Uh, so I decided, you know what, I've got I, I became a, a journalist, but I married a doctor. So I satisfied my close, mother. close. He, he was happy. <laughs> Paul Feinbaum with us now. OK, so you graduate from college. Um, you're starting to look at the the job circuit and the newspaper industry. Where do you end up landing? And and, and then take us through when you felt like, hey, I got, I think I got a chance here to to get on a major network. Well, it, uh, I'll speed through the story, but uh, coming out of school, you, you're, it's like you know all these uh, high school recruits. I mean, they they have all these different offers. I had two offers. Um, one was uh, from Bristol, Tennessee which is on the, the Tennessee Virginia border. And the other one is from Shreveport. And, and for the, and to this day, I don't know why I went West uh, because I was, I had a, a girlfriend who was actually from the same area uh, and something told me if I, if I, if I took the, the Tennessee job, I'd, I'd get married. I'd spend the rest of my life there. And I don't know why I chose the other way. Cause I made, I made it hard on myself, but it turned yeah. out to be a good move. So I went West I spent a year in Shreveport uh, covering everything under the sun. Uh, we covered uh, college football there. We were not far from Dallas, so I covered about six or seven Cowboys games, which was a big deal. Um, and I, I loved it. Uh, I, when I went to Birmingham a year later, uh, I, I primarily did investigative reporting. I, I thought I was literally going to change the world by by nabbing a couple of colleges in cheating scandals. I didn't realize everybody cheated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I got my feet wet there. And interestingly, though, by doing what I did, I probably uh, made sure that my newspaper career was going to be short circuited because I got involved in a very nasty case a couple about two years in. Uh, I also got to cover the end of Bear Bryant, which was which was great. But this yeah. case, uh, which coincided with his ending, uh, ended up getting the newspaper uh, sued. We won what all happened? these national awards. Um, I, I started to get offers. Uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, major metropolitan dailies, but I had to. We had to finish this uh, this trial. We won the lawsuit. And what was the, the time, lawsuit? It was a libel suit uh, uh, involving uh, the principal of a high school kid who was involved in this big scandal, and uh, it took two years to adjudicate. By the time it was over, we were victorious, and my newspaper career was officially dead. I mean, all these everybody stayed away. They they they, they said, "Oh my wow. goodness, we can't." Um, I became a columnist for a couple of years, uh, but I, I realized that I was probably not getting out. And, and it, it coincided with the, with the uh, advent of talk radio in America. And I, and I, I, I started dabbling with it. I caught the bug and then I balanced the newspaper and radio for quite a while, which was a juggling act Yep. and ultimately had to choose. And I, I ultimately chose radio. And then you 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 know you have the Paul Feinbaum Radio Network. You're doing multiple things, which is a huge story. And all these people that we have on, you got to dip your toes in in multiple um, multiple waters. You know, you gotta you gotta make sure that you're doing different things. I want to talk a little bit about you know when you think of the SEC, uh, you think of Paul Feinbaum, and you don't get to these places without getting the respect of your peers. How have you done that? It was difficult at first uh, as a as a young reporter. Uh, I was ostracized because I was doing something that had never been done. Uh, I was looking at both sides of the story. Uh, later, uh, I still was a, was a, was an outlier. Um, you know, and you know, it, it's not a big deal today to say, "Hey, somebody has a hot take. Somebody calls for somebody's head." I mean, that's 
That's, that's normal. Now. Hours. Yep. That's, that's Stephen A. Smith from morning till night. Um, <laughs> but back back then, it was a big deal. Uh, I was the first in Alabama. OK, to do that. But um, it. it it, it caused a lot of problems. Uh, I had, I had death threats. I had people that wanted to uh, do all kinds of things to me, but I, 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 I per- persevered and ultimately time will be on your side. Mm. Uh, I, I, I did modulate a little bit. I, uh, I mean, people have said I've mellowed. Well, I mean, I, you have to, I mean, you can't, uh, you, you can't just be, uh, you know, swinging a, a sword at all times uh, at all places and ESPN, affects you a little bit too because you're you suddenly you're on, you're on a, on a bigger platform right right and your words uh are are measured far more far more seriously uh, than you do if you're just a talk show host in, in Birmingham for instance uh, you know you're also one of the few that that stick up to some of these coaches specifically uh Nick Saban which I, I'm sure takes a lot of confidence I'm sure there's a lot of reporters that sometimes might pass on the tough question. What has given you the confidence to go toe in toe with a, a guy like Nick Saban? Is that like something younger in you, or is that just uh, the Paul? Now we'll talk, walk us through that. Yeah, that must be the uh, the the uh, the devil in me from from yesteryear. Um, you know, I got to know him pretty well when he was at LSU. When he came to Alabama, he was very very courteous uh, courteous with me, and we, we became friends. And he played a big role. Uh, you know the. Uh, you know, Nick Saban's career and my career uh, at, in Alabama were, had similar paths, and and there's there's I've never doubted a second, and, and I, I appreciate uh, what he has done. However, yeah. uh, I also believe that you you have to speak the truth, and I haven't. Uh, I mean, most of my existence with him has been very positive, but there've been a couple of moments. We had a blow up of. I think in 2015 or 16 on, on television during the, the SEC media days, uh, he was he refused to answer the question about why two of his star players uh, had not been suspended. And it became a Donnybrook. And next thing you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't set out to do it. I was on the, I was on a set uh, on the SEC network with four other people. And yeah, I, I, I interrupted him three times and he finally just like screamed like a, a, enough, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, it made big news. And I, and what made it even more re- remarkable is we were on a, we were on a stage and behind us, there were a bunch of reporters who started gravitating when, I mean, you could hear it. Um, when, when, the, when, the, when we went to the break, it continued and some reporters ended up getting it, uh, getting that. And that made he, it. He was yapping like, with you during the, the break. Well, he was, uh, he was not only, he was cursing. Uh, I mean, he was swearing at me. Um, and, and it was awkward though, because I, I had always, I had never had a crossword with the guy, but I also yeah. felt like, Hey man, answer the question. Uh, don't give me this nonsense. Uh, and yeah, you know, we made up, uh, he called me a couple hours later and, uh, and and we 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 mostly had a very good relationship. Now I will say this year has been different because uh, Alabama had a terrible season. They lost two mm-hmm. games. Uh, they finished fifth in the country. Um, and I ended up. It wasn't so much what I did on the, on the, the daily show that we do. It was weekly on first take or with Greenberg or somebody else when the conversation became a little more animated. And I had the nerve to say the dynasty, the, the window of the dynasty is closing. How yep. can, how can you not say that when uh, your biggest competitor has won two national championships? I also said on the day after the, the, the uh, national championship game this year, that Kirby smart has essentially moved into his spot. And, and yeah. uh, I, I, I would imagine that's caused some tension, but. Uh, you know, I, I can't say I can't stop and go, man, I'm I hope I don't upset Nick Saban. That, that's not my that's not my job. My job is to is to is to host a show and to give my opinions when I'm on ESPN about things that are important to the, the audience that we cater to. Absolutely. Paul Feinbaum with us. And you are the guy that I wanted for this question. I mean, this is timing is crazy. Um, Jim Bayon. Okay, there's been a couple of stories with him with college students in Syracuse is a juggernaut for producing broadcasters. I got to be honest with you. I I mean, I know I'm not really supposed to have uh, my opinion on this. I'm supposed to ask you. It really bothers me that um, a coach of his stature, a coach in general, is not answering or giving these uh, journalists that's asking fair questions uh, a hard time. What's your reaction when you see videos like that? 
disgraceful. Uh, as a preamble to this answer, uh, my last year at Tennessee, Jim Beheim was in the NCAA tournament in Knoxville in the first round. That's that's how far back I go with this guy, and and I've gotten to know him over the years. Not well, but but I know him, and I think it, it's disgraceful. Uh, it's an affront to common sense, and it it hurts me even more that one of my uh, old bosses and friends, John Wildtack, is his boss and has not said a word. I think Jim Beheim needs to go. Uh, not, not specifically over this issue, although th this is a contributing factor. But I think when you see his behavior in this and other situations, it's become pretty obvious. Mm that he's done uh yeah i i think john and the president uh, the president ought to just walk down to his office and say jim you've had a great career i think uh whatever the last game this year is in the big east tournament that will be your last uh, mm. it's time to go and, and and it 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 what bothers me the most is that jim Beheim has taken on the role of other coaches that i've seen uh, throughout my career who feel like they are entitled they can do whatever they want. They 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 are not to be held accountable, and, and that's wrong. Uh, no 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 coach in any sport uh, or any player for that matter is is bigger uh, than than the the game that that he he or she participates in. And what, you know when he said, I think to Pete Thamel that uh, you know I, I, I'll do what I want to do. At that moment, it was time for him yeah. to be carted off. And and I I'm very passionate about this. I, and. I mean, he's a bully, uh, and and he absolutely needs to go. And uh, I, I think, and, and it's, what's even more embarrassing is is the fact that Syracuse is one of the beacons uh, of broadcasting and and, and journalism uh, in this in this country. Uh, and I, I feel s sad for the students yep. of of that of that great university. I've been up there before. Uh, that, that have to have to deal with this uh, and, and not. Uh, and not see anything happen and the, and the most prominent person on that campus be held accountable. The coaches and media relationship is always interesting to me because, you know, without the media, um, there's probably not, I won't say there's not a league, but the, the attention of the league isn't there. So I understand that there's always going to be an, uh, an interesting relationship between coach and media, but you got to understand as a coach, I mean, without media, where are you? Are you getting the same salary? I I don't I don't know, but um, that relationship to me it needs to be a little bit more respected. But I, I agree with you. Um, but I will tell you, we are now in a new era in relationships between sports uh, entities and the media. And and I I'm not I'm, I'm not proficient on the NBA or the NFL because because but I do believe what in, in my in my limited understanding that there are requirements. You, the coaches have to deal with the media, but in college sports, there, there's no there's no there's there's no set steadfast rule uh, at a lot of schools that I cover. The, the assistant coaches are completely off limits. Uh, they're never made available, and I think the philosophy of a lot of college uh, athletic departments is we will produce the news on our own, and They'll we will control the narrative. Exactly. And they don't care. I mean, I've heard I've heard them say before, we don't need that guy. Uh, we don't need this guy. Um, I mean, they have no regard whatsoever for local media, which to me has always been the front line and the most important entity. They 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 care somewhat about uh, the bigger uh, vehicles because their games are shown on either the SEC or right. the ACC or the Big Ten Network or ESPN or one of the one of the tributaries. Uh, I just saw something the other day, a, a, a reporter for The Athletic, respected uh, publication uh, and, and, and news gathering source on the Internet. Uh, he left that. He left there to go to work for the school. And I'm like going that that didn't happen in my day. But now uh, it's happening more often. Mm. And what are they going to do with him? He's, he's probably going to manage uh, their media message. And that's just another reason to bypass local local uh, local media outlets, radio, TV, uh, blogs, website. I mean, you name it. Uh, I mean, you you can't call uh, newspapers newspapers anymore because you can't find a newspaper. Um, but that but there's a um, 
I, I'm extremely troubled by that. And what's even more troubling is that the fans don't know the difference and don't care because fans of, of every program, whether it's in professional sports or in college sports, want to read good things about their right. team. Right. And and this line has been obliterated. Uh, and for the next generation of, 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 of young sports journalists, I feel I, I feel terribly because I, I don't know where they're where they're going to go. I'm not saying it's over. There's always going to be outlets. Uh, but we knew when I when my parents and grandparents, you know, had the opportunity to judge for themselves. Uh, when I came up, I was part of that generation where things were changing. Um, I don't know about the next generation. Yeah. I want to ask you this last question because you um, are obviously very talented, but you're also around really talented people. And for the younger broadcasters out there, uh, including myself, you know, what's the overarching theme or characteristic that you see in the best broadcasters uh, around you? The, the ones that uh, I see work the hardest uh, and, and are most successful are, are, are tireless uh, entities. They're, they're Stephen A. Smith. I, I, I always hate to use him as the example, but he's a close friend and somebody I admire and have gotten to know. Uh, no one who works harder than him. Yeah, nobody also makes more money. Um, but that's beside the point. Uh, the, 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 great, the, the great and most successful people in the industry, I think, have had wide experience uh i'll use stephen a as an example he he was a he worked at school newspaper he played ball but he also he also he wrote for big dailies in philly and new york he's done everything uh and he 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 is relentless i I think overall i'll try to i'll try to make it succinct but to be successful uh i i firmly believe you you have to have an, an endless curiosity. Uh, you just don't accept whatever you're told as, as status quo, because it, it may be the truth. Probably isn't, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you you, ha- you have to be able to work with people. Um, b- uh, but mostly, uh, you you have to combine that. Uh, you have to have a, a sense of, uh, of smarts that, that coalesces with the others, the other the other aspects. And I, I don't I will not say just because you work harder makes will mean you will be more successful. But the common trait that I've seen in most of the top people is a is, is a work ethic that is second to none. Uh, I'm not suggesting you, you can't have a life. Um, but I would I would argue that to get to get to become successful, you have to be relentless and you and you have you need people around you that that understand what you're doing. It's it, it is very difficult. Uh, I, I think I, I think I thought I had it hard. I, I didn't. I, I was talking to uh, Adrian Wojciechowski once. Um, and he told me that uh, his, his daughter was having a birthday party and, you know, he always has his phone and he, he put his phone up for 15 minutes. While that happened, I don't know, the Sixers or somebody, I don't even know, you know, made a big trade. trade. And I mean, that's sad, but it's also the reality of of the world that we live in that that today, you know, when do you sleep? Uh, It's instant. You got to you got to be instant with with his position. Now, I will also say, I know we don't have time for me to start, you know, going old school. I don't really know why it matters that much, whether uh, he has a he has the trade at 1147 and uh, Yahoo has it at 1148 and the athletic has it. I mean, Twitter's a toxic place, Paul, but I've been there before. uh, And and I was, I was a reporter on the front line. Um, It doesn't really matter a whole lot to the people that consume it. It does matter to the people that employ those who uh, disseminate it. All right. Huge shout out to Paul Feinbaum for joining us today. Make sure to check out all the other podcasts and articles, bearsportsmedia.com. Thanks everyone for listening. And we will talk to you next Thursday here on the Sports Talkers podcast. Thank you for listening to the Sports Talkers podcast with Stephen Strong. A reminder that each episode can be found on iTunes, Spotify, and most podcasting platforms. To stay up to date on future episodes, visit barrettsportsmedia.com.